Hi everyone, so my name is Spencer and this is going to be behind the scenes for all the animations that I did for this album. And just for a super quick background, for the production of this project, I did everything myself and it was largely a collection of uh, first attempts for me. Uh, for production, I basically learned everything uh, along the way as I went from watching just tons of YouTube tutorials and I did all the composition myself too. And actually one of the hardest parts is that um, I've only been playing guitar for about two years now. So that was a super fun but really challenging part of this project and I'm really looking forward to actually being able to play this for real for all my future projects. So yeah, hopefully you find this behind the scenes interesting and thanks for checking out my music. So this is the drawing machine and in this video I'm going to go into extreme detail about how it works and every single part of it. Uh, but before I do that I'm going to show you all the drawings I did, uh, the actual ones from the video and a bunch of the test sheets too. So when put into binders, this is how many drawings I've actually made on this machine, both for the original drawings for the animation and all the practice runs too. So at the beginning of this binder are all the original drawings from the video. So these are the actual pieces of paper that you're seeing in the animations. And I'll mention now too that um, I'm doing this thing on my Etsy page where if you want one of these designs originally made on this machine, you can go to that page and order one, and on this exact machine, I'll draw you a custom pattern. And uh, that's something you can check out in the description there. And I'll start with a couple patterns there, but I'll keep on adding more, and you can get them in any color and any design that you want, basically. And I'll reference back to this binder again later, and at the end I'll show you actually all the pages individually, so you can see all these patterns. So every single drawing that you see for the animations was drawn right on this table by this machine, and it's 100% mechanical, all purely powered by this one Lego motor and through all these gears, and I'll go into extreme detail about how all this stuff works. So the entire machine is powered by these simple uh, Lego power functions pieces, and it turns on just like that. So the main design constraint that I had to work around on this machine build was that the whole thing is powered by this one motor, which just turns at one speed the whole time. But even with that really simplistic power source, it's divided into three main areas. This arm, this arm, and the table. And both arms run in forward or reverse in five different speeds. And the table, right here, can run forward or reverse in eight different speeds without the original motor changing at all. So it makes for a bunch of really repeatable and very accurate settings. So now I'll go into specifics about how each section of the machine works. And it can be split into four main parts. The variable speed gear reductions, the towers, the table, and the drawing arm. So first, the gear reduction for these two towers here is in this whole section here, which is the most complicated part of the machine. And this is just a mirror image case of this. It's just flipped over. So this powers this tower, and this powers that tower. And basically how this works and I'll try not to talk at, at the same time as using the machine because it's kind of loud. So I'll just let this run for a second and then I'll pause it and uh, talk some more about it. So we have the battery compartment here which is just wired to the switch just to turn it on and off. Then the motor, and this is the main axle from the motor which drives all the way forward to this section too, which is for the table, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But so for this side, the power goes through these gears and then straight forward to this arm. And then in this stage of uh, gear reductions here, it goes slower and slower and slower. So this is the fastest speed out of five, and this is the slowest speed out of five. And I'll zoom in on this and play it again, and turn it on again just so you can see how these are much faster than these ones. And since these are doubled up uh, for each pair too, that's where I get the forward and reverse uh, motion. So each of these are the same speed, and each of these are the same speed. But in each pair, we have a counterclockwise and clockwise motion. And uh, I'll zoom up there so you can see that. So like I said, this arm is just the same as this, but mirrored over. And then from the motor, directly from this main axle here, 
goes into this gear reduction, which uh, determines the speed of the table and also the direction of the table. And I'll zoom in on this really quick here. So just the same as these other ones, uh, on this side is the fastest and it goes slower and slower each time it goes through another gear reduction. And where these are doubled up forward and reverse on each one uh, to save some room because there were eight of them, I just have these going in alternate ways each time. And then the direction reversal is handled here. And I'll zoom in on this part here so you can see that too. kind of hard to see in the light, but if you can look at these pieces here, you'll notice that every other one is going the opposite direction. So then how I actually change the speed and direction of each of these main three parts is with these uh, universal joint uh, drive shafts here. And I can just disconnect these from each side and then just select what direction and speed I want. So if I want, uh, this is the fastest one, so maybe I want uh, this speed for one of the drawings. So I just put it on this one and then reattach it to this side. And that's the same for all three of these. So to show you how the power goes from this part up to the drawing arm, I'll, I'll tell you first and then I'll show it. So uh, it goes through here, through this uh, arm here with the universal joints. And then it goes through this axle here, which is hooked into this uh, worm gear assembly. It's a little bit easier to see on the other side. It's one of those standard worm gear boxes. And then from there, it goes up this axle, which is uh, connected to this rotating part here. It's not the same as this, actually. I'll talk about that later. Um, and then this axle rotates this part, which gives this drawing arm this uh, radius on this side. And I'll talk about that in a second. And the main reason I used worm gears here is because it makes for way less slop. Even though this has a little bit here, once it is in motion, it always uh, kind of keeps on the same side. Uh, the worm gear just gets a lot less slop in the system if I just use regular gears. It would be a lot uh, less accurate. So here it is in motion. And actually I'll do a faster one so it's a little bit easier to see. So this is now on speed one for this arm, which is the fastest speed. And then moving on to this part, I guess, you can see here how this detaches and I can select whatever radius I want for this arm and the other one. Both of these, like I said, are just mirrored, so I only have to talk about one of them. So basically, if I wanted no radius on this part, and basically have the arm just standing still, I would select this first one. And as you can see, um, this will still spin around, but the arm doesn't move at all. And in the same way, I could just disconnect this here, and it would do the same thing. So in this case, this pin is just right in line uh, with this bottom axle, so it doesn't give any rotation here. But if I wanted a much larger radius here, it's a little finicky to do with one hand, but so this is going to be a much larger radius now you'll be able to see. And all these changes like this, like changing one speed uh, to one that's very close to it or changing the radius to one notch over has a huge impact on how the drawing looks. And that's kind of how I was able to get very specific drawings and ones that look very similar to ones before it, but just slightly different. And uh, I'll show you more examples of that in the binders once I uh, go through all the other details about this. So then moving on to the table, I'll uh, take the drawing arm off so I can show you how this works. And I just use this as a resting place so the pen doesn't uh, draw the drawing before I want it to. So this is obviously not made of Legos, but this is just uh, made of 
ABS plastic and clear acrylic just all glued together so it's nice and flat and easy to uh, tape the piece of paper to each time and it's really heavy too so it uh, is pretty accurate so the drawing doesn't skip around too much. And these are the wheels that the table just rests on. These are not not powered at all, these just roll. And then this wheel here is what's actually attached to the motor. All the way from the motor, down this main axle here, through the gear reduction here to whatever speed I've chosen, through this axle here, into these gears, into this worm gear box, across to this wheel. And that's what actually drives the table and turns it around at a really specific speed. So I'll show you a couple different speeds of this just to show you how incredibly slow this wheel turns to uh, rotate the whole paper around. So this is the very fastest it goes. So that was speed one out of eight, and this is speed four out of eight, which is much slower. You could probably barely see that moving there, and speed eight is almost just looks like it's standing still. But having it be able to rotate that slow gives me tons of control over how that affects the drawing, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And for the actual drawing arm, it's made of the same uh, clear acrylic as the table, and I just drilled all these different holes so I can have a really accurate distance away from the table, and I'll show you how that affects it in just a second. And then this is the part that you see in all the animations going back and forth. And it's designed to hold these uh, Pilot G2 uh, refill cartridges. And those fit perfectly just like that. And a little bit of tape on the end just to have it not fall out. So that's what you're actually seeing in all the animations from this angle, obviously. So to explain how these drawing arm settings actually affect the drawing, um, if I have a, a low value here, so the pin would be here and here. This whole arm would move this way, and the pen would move outwards from the center and it would make a larger drawing. And if I want a smaller drawing of the same exact design without changing anything else, I would just have this pin maybe be on a hole way back here and way back here on this side, which would move the whole assembly this way and closer to the center of the drawing, which makes it smaller. And at a certain point, it actually crosses the center and then starts to make it bigger again, but you get the general idea. So that's pretty much how all the main parts of the machine work and it was pretty much just a matter of trial and error to find the cool looking patterns and I didn't really anticipate it but it actually turns out that most of the patterns that this is capable of drawing look terrible. Um, like 90% of them are just kind of random squiggles but actually it makes a decent amount of sense because uh, I figured out that this machine in theory could make about 125 million unique shapes <laughs> based on all the different settings, because um, with speeds and directions, it's 10 times 10 times 16. And with the pivot settings, that's times 40 times 40 times 7 times 7. So it's just a huge amount of possible shapes, and you just have to figure out what settings do what to the drawing to kind of, uh, you know, fine-tune it and get it to do what you actually want it to do. Uh, but, you know, it was kind of a learning curve to do that, but after a while I figured it out, and... Uh, that's what you see in a lot of the animations. I'm just making very strategic changes to the design, making it slightly more dense or slightly more spread apart, or uh, you know, changing things very uh, strategically like that. So now I'll go over some of these test sheets and just kind of show you how I uh, kept track of what settings I needed to do to make what shape. And that was done with these little codes in the corner like this. And you'll see every single one of these sheets has a different code. And that tells me uh, where to put the settings on the machine to go back and make that shape exactly how it was before. Um, and obviously on these test ones, uh, in the animation, this is one of those full donut shapes. Uh, but I only have to do a little bit of it to realize, you know, what kind of spacing I want and how dense it gets. So I didn't actually have to waste the time to do the whole thing. And I should mention, too, that... Uh, you might be surprised at how slow this machine actually works. Um, you probably saw it a little bit there in the first part of this video. But a drawing like this could easily take an hour and a half to do the whole thing. And I'd say most of these drawings uh, took between 30 minutes and 2 hours to do. And some of the really dense ones are extremely slow. 
So it's just kind of a matter of patience and letting the machine do its thing and hopefully no mistakes happen along the way. Uh, but for this one, so the code 1cc 2cc 8cc 2 over 26 3 over 31 and blue. So obviously, blue is just the color of the pen for that drawing. And these three categories are the speed and direction of the first arm, the speed and direction of the second arm, and the speed and direction of the table. So for this one, 1cc is one counterclockwise for this far section here for this tower. The second one is this one, and then the third one is this middle one which powers the table. So speed one counterclockwise, speed two counterclockwise, and speed eight counterclockwise. So like I showed you that this is the slowest speed for the table, that's what was required for this drawing uh, to make it this densely packed. And then these two are the settings for the arm and the rotating part that the arm fits on. So 2-26 or 2 over 26 is for this side here. 2 refers to the second hole from the middle, so the smallest radius for this rotating part. And then 26 is the 26th hole uh, from this side, and that gives you both of those values. And the same thing over here, 331, it's on a different setting now. but. That's basically what each code means. And that gives me every single detail about where the machine needs to start in order to reproduce this exact same drawing as many times as I want. And the only other uh, code that I needed just on some of the drawings was this sort of thing, which tells me the direction that these arms need to be facing when the drawing starts, which actually makes a big difference uh, for some of these designs. And a way I can make a drawing drastically different with only changing one setting is by changing the direction of the table. So I'll flip back and forth between these. They should be on the same page, but whatever. So take a look at that drawing and then this one. So they look pretty different. They do have some similarities. And we'll look at the codes and see how similar they are. Except for the color, we have 326, 231, and this. 326, 231, same direction, 1cc, 1c, 1cc, 1c, but the table speed on this one is 1, speed 1, clockwise, and it looks like that, and this one is speed 1, counterclockwise, and it looks like that. So the only difference is that this table is spinning counterclockwise and the other one is clockwise, and it makes the drawing look rounded on the outside where this one's like a saw blade design. And basically those two drawings are just inside out of each other. That's basically how this works. The uh, arms are drawing the same shape, but the, uh, the table is just going the opposite way. So that's what happens when you keep the same speed for the table and go in different directions. And then for just changing the speed, basically the speed of the table is how dense or how loosely packed these shapes will be, even though it's the same pattern. So I'll go between these a couple times, but take a look at these. So this is this spread out, and it gets slightly more dense, slightly more dense, and even more dense. So we'll see uh, 1cc, 1c, 6c, 5c is the only thing that changes, 4c and 3C, so it's just the speed that the table's rotating at. And basically, uh, what this does is if the table had no rotation at all, the arms would just draw this first oval forever. It would just trace the same exact oval. Uh, that's just how this works. And then the table basically makes this, you know, radially extruded around so that it's basically a spiral. So by the time the arms want to meet up again, the table has just shifted over ever so slightly so it doesn't line up again and it draws kind of a spiral oval right next to it. So by that logic, basically, the faster the table is rotating around, the further apart the arms are going to be uh, from the next time they get back to that starting place, if that makes any sense. So if the table's rotating really fast, the arm won't be able to catch up and be as close as where it started. 
So then we slow down the table a little bit. And when it gets back to that same start of the oval, it's much closer. And then you slow down the table even more, and it gets more densely packed, and then even more. And I think the reason I only went to six out of eight is because eight would just be like a solid blue donut. It would be so close that it would actually be closer together than the width of the line that the pen draws. So some of these just get way too dense, but when you get this kind of gradient where you have multiple layers of density, where it's totally solid blue and then it kind of spreads out from there, it gives it a really cool effect. But even though this one looks a lot denser than the other ones, take a look at this oval shape. It's exactly the same size and shape no matter how densely packed it is. So that oval's there, here, here, and here. It's the same thing. It never actually changes. It's just it gets pushed together more and more as the table slows down. And to get these kind of uh, thin pokey shapes, what I did is just disconnect one of the arms. So I disconnected this far one and just had this moving as well as the table moving. And you get this kind of shape. So X just means that it's disconnected speed one and speed three. And I'll show you some of those. And of course I didn't have to do the full drawing once I realized how densely packed it was. I could save some time. Uh, which actually means that a significant amount of these drawings on the actual animation was the first time I'd ever done that design just because uh, there's no point in wasting all the time to do a practice one and then the real thing too when some of the drawings took an hour and a half to do. And then uh, when we get to some of these other more abstract designs like this one, how I did that is you know, most of these other ones, I'm only really ever using speed one or two, generally. That's the most common for all these. It's either, you know, one or two in either direction. But for these ones, I actually use speed one and speed five. So it's really slow on one of the arms. And it gives you kind of a less symmetrical pattern. And uh, that's how I got these type of designs. They're slightly different from the ones in the video. But that kind of explains uh, how that works. I just really like the look of these type of drawings. And then this test sheet is actually how I planned out the size of these rings for the uh, animation on Enigma, even though it was blue. And this is just all the uh, arm settings to change, you know, the actual radius of this. That's what I was talking about before, how the arms move in and out to make the drawing bigger or smaller. And I just did that super accurately on this. And uh, you might have actually realized already that if you change nothing other than making the arms make the drawing bigger and you don't change the speed of the table, the drawing will become more uh, loosely packed. It will become less dense out here because it has to travel a further distance away while doing the same arm motion. So here are actually the speeds of the table as I extend this out further and further. So the middle one is at speed 4. But if I had speed 4 also for this outer one, they'd be way looser and way more uh, far apart. So I have the table gradually go slower and slower uh, for the outermost rings. And then there's designs like this that just look great. And uh, these bigger ones are actually, I'm going to do more of these for the ones that I'll put up on Etsy just because they're much more detailed. Um, the reason I couldn't do so many of these bigger ones for the animation is that because the table was rotating, I just didn't have enough room to, you know, have the paper run off the screen. So I had to make all the drawings really small. But you get a lot more detail when you're able to make the drawing bigger. And like I just said, then you slow the table down to compensate for that uh, speed and density loss. And then it packs these in uh, tight, just like they were for the smaller drawings at a higher table speed. And then this one I actually used. So this is the size of most of the animations that I did, and these are the larger ones. After doing all these animations, I noticed that there's this really weird effect to a lot of these drawings, actually, where there's a seven-fold symmetry to a ton of these drawings, and I didn't plan for this at all. It's not something that I designed into the system. Just something about how fast the table's spinning through any of these gear settings produces a seven-fold symmetry 
which is just really strange because I did not anticipate that at all. So this drawing machine that I've been showing you is actually the third version of this machine that I designed. And you might be surprised at how crazy the first two look and how horrible the first one was. Um, but in this picture here, so this is the second version of the machine, which is really similar to the third one, just kind of a worse version of the third one. Overall, it was a really similar design where it used the same table pieces and it basically accomplished the same thing. It just didn't have nearly as many settings and it was really kind of literally grinding the gears and I actually broke a few Lego gears because there was so much tension in the whole system that it just kind of broke itself apart. Um, but that's kind of an overview of what this looks like and it's even more convoluted looking than the third one actually just because I was just figuring it out as I went basically. There was no design or plan uh, going into this really. I just kind of figured it out as I went. So here's some detail about, uh, this is the back of one of the towers. And again, this was mirrored over on the right side. And you can just see how convoluted the whole thing is. It's way over complicated. And actually this uh, differential design, you can see in the bottom center there, that's actually how I handled the direction reversal was by pinning this uh, differential moving back and forth and locking one gear to a fixed one. And I'll show you more detail about that in just a second. So one of the main differences between version two and version three this is still version two here, is that you see these two red gears in the middle and then the third one, the gray one, right on top of that. This was kind of the speed transmission of the machine. So this bottom red gear here, you can actually slide this to the left and right on that axle and which of these three gray gears below it in, it engaged with would determine the speed. So I basically had speed one, two, and three for that gear and then one, two, and three for the red gear on top of that, which was the other arm, and then speed one, two, or three for that top gray gear, which was the speed for the table. So it just didn't give me nearly as many options as I needed. It was just speed uh, one was way too fast and ended up breaking some Lego gears just because it was way over torquing the whole thing. And speed three was just way too slow. So speed two was really the only effective speed. And then there was really no point in having a speed differential at all if it was just always on the same speed for everything. So it was just way over-engineered and it just didn't work very well at all. And this is kind of what my desk looked like when I was <laughs> trying to design this and uh, tried to keep it as neat as possible, but that didn't really work out too well. So here's kind of an up-close of how I was handling the first stages of uh, gear reduction. And uh, you can kind of see where the power would be transferred through. I was using a smaller motor here um, and I actually, because this design put so much strain on the whole thing, I actually burned that motor out pretty quickly, so I had to get that larger one. And here's up close again of the same thing, just from a different angle. You can see how that top gray gear would slide to the right and left on that axle and engage with a different set of these gears. And each one of those is from a different stage of this uh, gear reduction here. So then this is that same left tower that I showed you earlier. And this is that uh, differential and how I would change the direction with it. Unfortunately, I don't have video of this, but with these two pictures, you'll be able to see on this one, the gear is over onto the right side. And this one, the gear is sandwiched over to the left. And if I go back and forth between these, you might be able to tell it's really convoluted. And that's how I accomplished the direction reversal for each of the two towers. And to show you where this whole thing kind of started, this was version one. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. This thing was an absolute monstrosity. It weighed probably 60 or 70 pounds and was made out of particle board and plywood and a bunch of hand cut gears. And I'll show you more detail in a second, but each of these gears was cut by hand from sheets of ABS plastic using a gear stencil on a bandsaw. And I individually cut and sanded every single tooth for, I don't know, like 20 or 25 gears. It was ridiculous. It took so long. Um, but this was my first design and I, I thought it was going to work and it kind of did. I'll show you some of the drawings in a second. It did work, but it was just way too heavy and, and just ridiculously convoluted. And here's some up close detail of some of those gears. I did a pretty good job. They meshed pretty well, but the whole thing just had way too much grinding and slop and it was super noisy and just really, really heavy. And there was no way I was going to get any of the Lego motors to actually turn this thing around. It required so much force just to get anything into motion. 
And that's one of the main designs that I wanted to change with version two and three. And I actually accomplished with three where there's no tension anywhere in the system. It's all based on gear reduction. So the motor can just spin freely the whole time and there's no strain anywhere in the whole system, which is the opposite <laughs> of what I was doing here. And here's a video I took just showing you how jumpy and hard to move this whole thing was. It did actually make some cool patterns, but it was just way too jumpy and nothing was smooth at all. The original design was also <laughs> powered by these Lego train tracks to make the whole donut part spin around, which I later revised to bearings because they rolled smoother, but this was the original design. So you saw in that previous video clip where the track was kind of moving up and down. So in this one, I uh, bolted the tracks down securely to the base. And then here is how I determined where each uh, gear would have to be centered to actually mesh with the proper other gear size. And it was this whole convoluted system that I was trying to uh, make work. And I sort of did, but not really. So here's mounting the ABS plates on it to hold all the gears. And this is how many gears I cut. And actually it was more than this. I cut this entire set out of wooden gears first and then I realized that the plywood was really cheap and the gears, the gear teeth were breaking off and it didn't really work so I redid the entire set out of plastic and even that ended up obviously not being good enough for this project. So here's those gears a little bit more finished with the center holes drilled. So here's some of the test drawings that I did on that first giant uh, wooden machine and as you can see it makes some cool shapes and it did actually accomplish making some of these uh, really complicated shapes, but the whole thing, if you notice, I'll zoom in closer, it's just really kind of wonky and there was so much slop in the gears and there was so much weight being thrown around that the whole thing just uh, was really kind of bumpy and it didn't draw anything smooth. I did make this one where I colored it in with Sharpie, it looks kind of cool, but I wasn't going to do that for all the drawings, obviously. Here's some other ones, a really, really bad circle. <laughs> You can see where, you know, there was a design, it just wasn't executing it very well. But it definitely had potential, so that's why I continued on and made a much better version of it. But I was still able to change the gears accurately and get different point symmetry, you know? Like this one is three, and well, this one's also three. This is one of my favorites, uh, the really wonky circle oval type deal. Yeah, that was a keeper. And this one just drew this kind of double lima bean shape forever. Yeah, definitely some keepers here. This was actually from uh, version 2. So I think that about covers it for this drawing machine video. And like I said in the beginning, if you want any of these uh, patterns for yourself uh, on my Etsy store, I'm drawing these on my machine and you can order uh, whatever design you want on there in any color. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, go ahead and uh, check out the link in the description there. And now just at the end of the video, I'll quickly go through and show you every page of both of these binders and you can pause it on anything if you want to check that out just so you can see actually every single test sheet that I did on this and feel free to pause it where you want. And if you found any of this stuff interesting, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm going to be doing some more of these behind the scene videos uh, for the Rubik's Cube animation and the other hand-drawn animations too. And I'll be posting those in the next couple weeks, so uh, make sure you catch that stuff as well. So if you want to check out some other things that I've made, go to my puzzle channel that's linked in the description there, and I make stuff like this. So I hope you found this interesting, and thanks for watching.